The Subcommittee on Information Technology will come to order, and without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Welcome to the first hearing in a series of hearings on artificial intelligence. This series is an opportunity for the subcommittee to take a deep dive into artificial intelligence. And today's hearing is an opportunity to increase Congress's understanding of artificial intelligence, including its development uses and the potential challenges and advantages of government ad adoption of artificial intelligence. We have four experts on the matter whom I look forward to hearing from today. And in the next hearing we do in March, I believe, we will hear from government agencies about how they are or should be adopting artificial intelligence into their operations, how they will use AI to spend taxpayer dollars wisely and make each individual's interactions with the government more efficient, effective, and secure. It's important that we understand both the risk and rewards of artificial intelligence, and in the third hearing in April, we will discuss the appropriate roles of both the public and private sectors as artificial intelligence matures. Artificial intelligence is a technology that transcends borders. We have allies and adversaries, both nation states and individual hackers, who are pursuing artificial intelligence with all they have because dominance in artificial intelligence is, is a guaranteed leg up in the realm of geopolitics and economics. At the end of this series, it's my goal to ensure that we have a clear idea of what it takes for the United States to remain the world leader when it comes to artificial intelligence. Thoughtful engagement by legislators is key to this goal, and I believe that this committee will be leaders on this topic. So what is artificial intelligence? Hollywood's portrayal of artificial intelligence is not accurate. Instead, many of us are already using it every single day, from song recommendations in Spotify to digital assistants that tell us the weather. And while these consumer applications are important, I'm most excited about the possibility of using artificial intelligence in the government to defend our infrastructure and have better decision making because of the analytics that artificial intelligence can run. In an environment of tightening resources, artificial intelligence can help us do more for less money and help to provide better citizen-facing services. I thank the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to hearing and learning from you so that we can all benefit from the revolutionary opportunities AI provides us. As always, I'm honored to be exploring these issues in a bipartisan fashion. I think the IT subcommittee is a leader on doing things in a bipartisan way. With my friend and ranking member, the Honorable Robin Kelly from the great state of Illinois. Thank you. Welcome to the witnesses. Thank you, Chairman Hurd, and welcome to all of our witnesses today, and happy Valentine's Day. Artificial intelligence, or AI, has the capacity to improve how society handles some of its most difficult challenges. In medicine, the use of AI has the potential to save lives and detect illnesses early. One MIT study found that using machine learning algorithm, algorithms reduced human errors by 85% when analyzing the cells of lung cancer patients. And earlier this month, Wired Magazine reported hospitals have now begun testing software that can check the images of a person's eyes for signs of diabetic eye disease, a condition that if diagnosed too late can result in vision loss. In some communities around the country, self-driving cars are, are already operating on the road and highways. That makes me nervous, but. Investment by major car companies in self-driving cars makes it increasingly likely that they will become the norm, not the exception on our nation's roads. But there is a lot of uncertainty revolving around artificial intelligence. AI is no longer the fantasy of science fiction and is increasingly used in everyday life. As the use of AI expands, it is critical that this powerful technology is implemented in an inclusive, accessible, and transparent manner. In its most recent report on the future of AI, the National Science and Technology Council issued a dire assessment of the state of diversity within the AI industry. The NSTC found that there was a, quote, lack of gender and racial diversity in the AI workforce, and that this, quote, mirrors the lack of diversity in the technology industry and the field of computer science generally. According to the NSTC in the field of AI, improving diversity, and I quote, is one of the most critical and high priority challenges. The existing racial and gender gaps in the tech industry add to the challenges the AI field faces. 
although, although women compromise approximately 18% of computer science graduates in the nation, only 11% of all computer science engineers are female. African Americans and Hispanics account for just 11% of all employees in the technology sector, despite making up 27% of the total population in this country. Lack of AI workforce diversity can have real costs on individuals' lives. The increasing use of AI to make consequential decisions about people's lives is spreading at a fast rate. Currently, AI systems are being used to make decisions by banks about who should receive loans, by government about whether someone is eligible for public benefits, and by courts about whether a person should be set free. However, research has found considerable flaws and biases can exist in the algorithms that support AI systems, calling into question the accuracy of such systems and its potential for unequal treatment of some Americans. For AI to be accurate, it requires accurate data and learning to learning sets to draw conclusions. If the data provided is biased, the conclusions will likely be biased. A diverse workforce will likely account for this and use more diverse data and learning sets. Within the industry, the use of black box algorithms are exasperating the problems of bias. Two years ago, ProPublica, ProPublica investigated the use of computerized risk prediction tools that were used by some judges in criminal sentencing and bail hearings. The investigation revealed that the algorithm the systems relied upon to predict recidivism was not only inaccurate, but biased against African Americans who were, quote, twice as likely as whites to be labeled a higher risk, but not actually reoffend. Judges were using this information derived from black box software to make life-changing decisions on whether someone is let free or receives a harsher sentence than appropriate. Increasing the transparency of these programs and ensuring a diverse workforce is engaged on developing AI will help decrease bias and make software more inclusive. Increasing diversity among the AI workforce helps avoid the, the negative outcomes that can occur when AI development is concentrated among certain groups of individuals, including the risk of biases in AI systems. As we move forward in this great age of technological modernization, I'll be focused on how the private sector, con Congress, and regulators can work together to ensure that AI technologies continue to innovate successfully and socially responsibly. I want to thank our witnesses for testifying today and look forward to hearing your thoughts on how we can achieve this goal. And again, thank you, Mr. Chair. I recognize the distinguished gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Massey, is here. He's not a, a member of this subcommittee, so I ask unanimous consent that he fully is able to fully participate in this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Now I get to, I'm pleased to announce and introduce our witnesses. Our first one is Dr. Amir Khazro Shahi, is Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of the Artificial Intelligence Products Group at Intel. Welcome. Dr. Charles Isbell, Isbell, Isbell is Executive Associate Dean at the College of Computing within the Georgia Institute of Technology. Dr. Oren Etzioni is the Chief Executive Officer at the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. And Dr. Ann Buck is Vice President and General Manager of Accelerated Computing at NVIDIA. Welcome to you all and pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before you testify, so please Arise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Now, please let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written statement will be made part of the record. And as a reminder, the clock in front of you shows your remaining time. The light will turn yellow when you have 30 seconds left. And when it turns red, your time is up. And please remember to also push the button uh, to turn on your microphone before speaking. And now it's a pleasure to recognize Dr. Kashorasji, Shahahi, excuse me, um, for uh, your initial five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Hurd, Ranking Member Kelly, and members of the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, Subcommittee on Information Technology. My name is Amir Khazroshahi, and I'm the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer of Intel Corporation's Artificial Intelligence Products Group. We're here today to discuss artificial intelligence, a term that was an aspirational concept until recently. While definitions of artificial intelligence vary, my work at Intel focuses on applying 
machine learning algorithms to real world scenarios to offer benefits to people and organizations. Thanks to technological advancements, AI is now emerging as a fixture in our daily lives. For instance, speech recognition features, recommendation engines, and bank fraud detection systems all utilize AI. These features make our lives more convenient, but AI offers society so much more. For example, AI healthcare solutions will revolutionize patient diagnosis and treatment. Heart disease kills one in four people in the United States. It is difficult for doctors to accurately diagnose disease because different conditions present similar symptoms. That's why doctors mainly have had to rely on experience and instinct to make diagnoses. More experienced doctors tend to diagnose correctly three out of four times. Those with less experience, however, just half the time, as accurate as a flipping of a coin. Patients suffer due to this information gap. Recently, researchers using AI accurately spotted the difference between the two types of heart disease nine out of 10 times. In this regard, AI democratizes expert diagnoses for patients and doctors everywhere in the world. AI is also contributing positively to agriculture. The population is growing and by 2050, we will need to produce at least 50% more food to feed everyone. This will become increasingly challenging as societies will need to produce more food with less land to grow crops. Thankfully, AI applications provide tools to improve crop yields and quality while also reducing consumption of resources like water and fertilizer. These are just a few examples of how AI is helping our communities. However, as we continue to harness the benefits of AI for societal good, governments will play a major role. We are in the early days of innovation of a technology that can do tremendous good. Governments should make certain to encourage this innovation, and they should be wary of regulation that will stifle its growth. At the federal level, the United States government can play an important role in enabling the further development of AI technology in a few ways. First, since data fuels AI, the US government should embrace open data policies. To realize AI's benefits, researchers need to have access to large data sets. Some of the most comprehensive data sets are currently owned by the federal government. This data is a taxpayer-funded resource which, if made accessible to the public, could be utilized by researchers to train algorithms for future AI solutions. The Open Government Data Act makes all non-sensitive US government data freely available and accessible to the public. Intel supports this bill and calls for a swift passage. Second, the US government can help prepare an AI workforce. Supporting universal STEM education is a start, but federal funding for basic scientific research at universities via agencies like the National Science Foundation is important to both train graduate level scientists and contribute to our scientific knowledge base. Current federal funding levels are not keeping pace with the rest of the industrialized world. I encourage lawmakers to con consider the tremendous returns on investment to our economy that funding science research produces. In addition to developing the right talent to develop AI solutions, governments will have to confront with labor displacement. AI's emergence will displace some workers, but too little is known about the types of jobs and industries that will be most affected. Bills like HR 4829, the AI Jobs Act, help bridge that information gap by calling for the Labor Department to study the issue and to work with Congress on recommendations. Intel supports this bill as well and encourages Congress to consider it in committee. AI promises many societal benefits and government and industry should work together to harness them and also to set up guidelines to encourage ethical deployment of AI and to prevent it from being used in improper ways that could harm the public. I cannot stress enough how important it is that lawmakers seize the opportunity to enable AI innovation. As US lawmakers consider, consider what to do in response to the emergence of AI, I encourage you to use a light touch. Legislating or regulate, regulating AI too heavily will only serve to disadvantage Americans, especially as governments around the world are pouring resources into tapping into AI's potential. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. The government will play an important role in enabling us to harness AI's benefits while preparing society to participate in an AI-fueled economy. Determining whether or how existing legal and public policy frameworks may need to be altered will be an iterative process. Intel stands ready to be a resource as you consider these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kazwa Shahi. Uh, Dr. Isbell, you're now recognized for five minutes. 
Chairman Hurd, uh, Ranking Member Kelly, and distinguished members of this subcommittee, my name is Dr. Charles Isbell. I am a professor and executive associate dean for the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee. As requested by the subcommittee, my testimony today will focus on the potential for artificial intelligence and machine learning to transform the world around us and how we might collectively best respond to this potential. There are many definitions of AI. My favorite one is that it is the art and science of making computers act the way they do in the movies. In the movies, computers are often semi-magical, anthropomorphic. They do things that if humans did them, we would say they required intelligence. As noted by the chairman, if that is AI, then we already see AI in our everyday lives. We use the infrastructure of AI to search more documents than any human could possibly read in a lifetime to find the answers to a staggering variety of questions, often expressed literally as questions. We use that same infrastructure to plan optimal routes for trips, even altering our routes on the fly in face of changes in traffic. We let computers finish our sentences, sometimes facilitating a subtle shift from prediction of our behavior to influence over our behavior, and we take advantage of these services by using computers in our phones or home speakers to interpret a wide variety of spoken commands. All of this is made possible because AI systems are fundamentally about computing and computing methods for automated understanding and reasoning, especially ones that leverage data to adapt their behavior over time. That AI is really computing is an important point to understand. What has enabled many of the advances in AI is the stunning increase of computational power combined with the ubiquity of that computing. That AI also leverages data is equally important. The same advances in AI are also due in large part to the even more stunning increase in the availability of data, again, made possible by ubiquity, in this case of the internet, social media, and relatively inexpensive sensors, including cameras, GPS, microphones, all embedded in devices we carry with us, connected to computers that are in turn connected to one another. By leveraging computing and data, we are moving from robots that assemble our cars to cars that almost drive themselves. One can be skeptical, as I am, that we will in the near future create AI that is capable as humans are in performing a wide variety of general ta the sort of general tasks that humans grapple with every day simultaneously. But it does seem that we are making strong progress toward being able to solve a lot of very hard individual tasks as well as humans. We may not replace all three million truck drivers and taxi cab drivers, nor all three million cashiers in the United States, but we will increasingly replace many of them. We may soon trust the x-ray machine to itself to tell us whether we have a tumor as much as we trust the doctor. We may not automate away intelligence analysts, but AI will shape and change their analyses. So AI exists and is getting better. It is not the AI of science fiction, neither benevolent intelligence working with humans as we traverse the galaxy, nor malevolent AI that seeks humanity's destruction. Nonetheless, we are living every day with machines that make decisions that if humans made them, we would attribute to intelligence. As noted by the ranking member, it is worth noting that these machines are making decisions for humans and with humans. Many AI researchers and practitioners are engaged in what we might call interactive AI. The fundamental goal there is to understand how to build intelligent agents that must live and interact with large numbers of other intelligent agents, some of whom may be human. Progress towards this goal means that we can build artificial systems that work with humans to accomplish tasks more effectively, can respond more robustly to changes in the environment, and can better coexist with humans as long-lived partners. But as with any partner, it is important that we understand what our partner is doing and why. To make the most of this emerging technology, we will need a more informed citizenry, something we can accomplish by requiring that our AI partners are more transparent on the one hand, and that we are more savvy on the other. By, tra by transparency, I mean something relatively simple. An AI algorithm should be inspectable. The kind of data the algorithm uses to build its model should be available. It is useful to know that your medical AI was trained to detect heart attacks mostly in men. The decisions that the system makes should be explainable and understandable. In other words, as we deploy these algorithms, each algorithm should be able to explain its output and its decisions. This applicant was assigned higher risk because is not only more useful, but is less prone to abuse than just this applicant was assigned a higher risk. To understand such machines, much less to create them, we have to strive for everyone to not only be literate, but to be compurate. That is, they must understand computing and computational thinking and how it fits into problem solving in their everyday lives. I'm excited by these hearings. Advances in AI are central to our economic and social future. The issues that are being raised here are addressable and can be managed with thoughtful support for robust funding and basic research in artificial intelligence, as noted by my colleague, support for ubiquitous and equitable computing education throughout the pipeline, 
K-12 and beyond, and in developing standards for the proper use of intelligent systems. I thank you very much for your time and attention today, and I look forward to working with you and your efforts to understand how we can best develop these technologies to create a future where we are partners with intelligent machines. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Etzioni, you're now up for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Hurd and Ranking Member Kelly, distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the nature of AI and the role of federal government. My name is Orin Etzioni. I'm the CEO of the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which is backed by Paul Allen. We call ourselves AI2. Uh, founded in 2014, AI2 is a nonprofit research institute whose mission is to improve lives by conducting uh, high impact research and engineering in the field of AI for, for the common good. The goal of my brief uh, remarks today is to help uh, demystify AI and cut through a lot of the hype uh, on, on the subject, and I'm, I'm delighted to uh, talk to, to you in particular, uh, Chairman, with a computer science degree, but uh, it's really important to me to make sure that uh, my remarks are understandable by everybody and that we don't confuse uh, science fiction with the real science and Hollywood and hype with what's actually going on. Uh, what we do have are uh, these very narrow systems that are increasingly sophisticated, but they're also uh, extremely difficult uh, to build. We need to work to increase the supply of people who can do this, and uh, that's uh, going to be achieved through increased diversity, but also through uh, immigration. And so, so many of us are um, uh, immigrants to this country. At AI2, we have 80 people who come from literally uh, all, all over the world, from Iran, from uh, Israel, from India, et cetera, et cetera. We need to, uh, to, to continue to welcome these people so we can continue to build uh, these systems. I have a, a number of thoughts, but I actually want to address the issue that uh, came up just in the conversation now about uh, transparency uh, and bias, and certainly the concerns that we have about these database systems uh, generating unfairness. Obviously, we want the systems to be fair, and obviously we want them to be uh, transparent. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as it sounds, right? These are complex statistical models that are uh, ingesting enormous amounts of data, millions and billions of examples, and, uh, and generating uh, conclusions. So we have to be careful, and I think the phrase light touch uh, is a great one here. We have to be very careful that we don't legislate transparency, but rather that we uh, attempt to build algorithms that are uh, more favored, uh, more desired, because they're more transparent. Um, I think legislating transparency or trying to do that would actually be a mistake, because uh, ultimately consider the following dilemma. Uh, let's say you have a diagnostic system that's highly transparent and 80% accurate. You've got another diagnostic system that's making a decision about a key treatment. It's not as transparent, okay? That's very disturbing, but it's 99% accurate. Which system would you want to have diagnosing you or, or your child? That, that's a real, uh, a real dilemma. So I think um, we need to balance these issues and be careful not to rush to legislate what's uh, complex technology here. While I'm talking about legislation and regulation and the kinds of uh, decisions you'll be making, I want to emphasize that I believe that we should not be regulating and legislating about AI as a field. It's amorphous, it's fast moving. Where does software uh, stop and AI begin? Uh, is Google an AI system? Uh, it's really quite complicated. Instead, I would argue we should be thinking about AI applications. Let's say uh, self-driving cars. Uh, th that's something that we should be regulating, if only because right, there's a patchwork of uh, municipal and state regulations that are going to be very confusing um, and disjointed, and that's a great role for the federal government. The same with AI toys, right? If, if Barbie has a chip in it uh, and it's talking to my child, I want to be assured that there's some guidelines and some regulations about what uh, information Barbie can take from my child uh, and share publicly. So, so I think that if we think about applications, that's a great role for regulation. And then the last point I want to make is that we need to remember that AI is a tool. 
It's not uh, something that's going to take over. It's not something that's going to make decisions for us, even in the context of criminal justice. It's a tool that's working side by side with a human. And so long as we don't just rubber stamp its decisions, but rather uh, listen to what it has to say, but make our own decisions, and realize that maybe AI ought to be thought of as augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, then I think we're going to be uh, in great shape. Thank you very much. Dr. Buck, you're on the clock. Five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Hurd, Ranking Member Kelly, and distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate your invitation to give testimony today on this important subject of AI. My name is Ian Buck. I'm the Vice President and General Manager of Accelerated Computing at NVIDIA. Our company is headquartered in Silicon Valley and has over 11,000 employees. Uh, in 1999, NVIDIA invented a new type of processor called the Graphics Processing Unit, or the GPU. It was designed to accelerate computer graphics for games by processing millions of calculations at the same time. Today, GPUs are used for many applications, including virtual reality, self-driving cars, AI, and high-performance computing. In fact, America's fastest supercomputer at Oak Ridge National Labs uses 18,000 NVIDIA GPUs for scientific research. Our involvement with AI began about seven years ago, when researchers started using our processors to simulate human intelligence. Up until that time, computer programs required domain experts to manually describe objects or features. Those systems took years to develop, and many were never accurate enough for widespread adoption. Researchers discovered that they could teach computers to learn with data in a process we call training. To put that in context, to teach a computer how to accurately recognize vehicles, for example, you need about 100 million data points and images and an enormous amount of computation. Without GPUs, uh, training such a system would take months. Uh, today's GPU-based systems can do this in about a day. The world's leading technology companies have aggressively adopted AI. Google and Microsoft's algorithms now recognize images better than humans. Facebook translates over two billion language queries per day. Netflix uses AI to personalize your movie recommendations, and all those systems rely on thousands of GPUs. My job is to help companies like these bring intelligent features to billions of people. But AI's impact isn't just limited to tech companies, self-driving cars, as which was mentioned, surgical robots, smart cities that can detect harmful activities, even solving fusion power. AI holds the best promise to solve these previously unsolvable problems. Here's a short list of problems for which I think AI could help. First, cyber defense. We need to protect government data centers and our citizens from cyber attack. The scale of the problem is mind-boggling, and we're working with Booz Allen Hamilton to develop faster cybersecurity systems and train federal employees in AI. Second, as was mentioned, healthcare. Nearly two million Americans die each year from disease. We could diagnose them earlier and develop more personalized treatments. The National Cancer Institute and Department of Energy are using AI to accelerate cancer research. Third, waste, fraud, and abuse. The GAO reported that agencies made $144 billion in improper payments in fiscal 2016. The commercial sector is already using AI to reduce such costs. PayPal uses AI to cut their fraud rate in half, saving billions. And Google used AI to lower the cost of its data centers by 40%. Fourth, defense platform sustainment costs. Maintenance costs are a huge challenge for the DOD, typically equaling 50% or more of the cost of a major platform, totaling over $150 billion annually. GE is already using AI to detect anomalies and perform predictive maintenance on gas turbines, saving them $5 million per plant each year. These are complex problems that require innovative solutions. AI can help us better achieve these results in less time and at lower cost. For the role of government, I have three recommendations. First, fund AI research. The reason we have neural networks today is because the government funded research for the first neural network in 1950. The America leads the world in autonomous machine vehicle technology because DARPA funded self-driving car competitions over a decade ago. While other governments have aggressively raised their research funding, the U.S. research has been relatively flat. We should boost research funding through agencies like the NSF, NIH, and DARPA. We also need faster supercomputers, which are essential for AI research. Second, drive agency adoption of AI. Every major federal agency, just like every major tech company, needs to invest in AI. 
Each agency should consult with experts in the field who understand AI and recruit or train data scientists. Three, open access to data. Data is the fuel that drives the AI engine. Opening access to vast sources of data available to the federal, uh, to the federal government would help develop new AI capabilities so we can eliminate more mundane tasks and enable workers to focus on problem solving. In closing, AI is the biggest economic and technological revolution to take place in our lifetime. By some estimates, AI will add $8 trillion to the US economy by 2035. The bottom line is we cannot afford to allow other countries to overtake us, and I thank you for your consideration, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank all of y'all. Now it's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes for his first round of questions. To the doctor from Intel, I don't want to try to pronounce your name, but help me out with that. Kasra Shahi. Kasra Shahi. Uh, you said that uh, AI was aspirational, but now it's reality. What, where did we cross the threshold? In the, in the uh, 90s, I worked at the AI lab at MIT. I worked on the hardware because the software problem was too hard. Um, and it seemed like you could solve certain engineering problems um, in the software, but it still feels that way to me. Where, what milestone did we cross? What threshold? So um, I hear this a lot, that um, people studied neural networks in the 90s, and they're kind of curious what has changed. And so let me just put it into a broader context. The history of AI goes back to the 1930s. Uh, the individuals who started the field, John von Neumann and Alan Turing, um, they were also the first people to build computers. So the history of AI and computing has been tightly intertwined. So computing, as uh, Dr. Isbell mentioned, is really critical. Compute power has dramatically increased uh, since your time to today. Another uh, uh, thing that's changed is data. And uh, the algorithms potentially have not changed so much. They might look very familiar to you, but there has been actually a remarkable amount of innovation in the space of machine learning, which is a dominant form of AI, and in neural networks that uh, Ian mentioned that is a state of the art today. And invariably, these things change with time. The, the state of the art in AI changes with time, but what the three things that are different today are um, computing power, um, data, and innovation in algorithms. This, this next question I'd like to ask all four of you. Um, if there were going to be an X Prize for AI, what is the next big milestone? What's the, the sword in the stone that um, somebody should try to pull out? And if they do, they deserve a big reward. Dr. Etezion. I would observe that every time we build one of these systems, whether it's in medicine or self-driving cars or, or speech recognition, we're kind of starting from scratch, right? We have to train them with these millions or hundreds of millions of examples. We have to set the architecture by hand, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we could build, as, as Charles was alluding to, more general systems, which is something that we're very far from being able to do today, a system that can work across multiple tasks simultaneously without being retrained by hand every time, that would be a major breakthrough. So, um, Dr. Buck, what would it be for you? Maybe driving from New York to uh, LA? <laughs> I think we've had our X Prize in self-driving cars with the work that DARPA did to kick off the industry innovation. There's a huge uh, market for the first car company to really come up with a mass-produced self-driving vehicle. I think AI at this point has the opportunity to revolutionize individual fields, and some could help from, benefit from an X Prize. Certainly, healthcare. I think if we can identify. Uh, an opportunity to do personalized medicine, to look at the genomics data that, we, that we've been able to get flooded with, with new instruments, and apply AI to understanding the net treatments that are gonna solve diseases. Many of them just need to be detected earlier. If we could find them early, we can treat them. If we wait till they act, the symptoms surface with today's technology, it's sadly too late. And if I had to add one more, I think there's huge opportunities for AI to improve our infrastructure, transportation, and just in, apply it to, to real modern problems today. 
Uh, Kansas City is doing a great project right now on detecting potholes with AI. They're actually uh, gathering all the data from uh, the weather data, the um, traffic information, and trying to predict when a pothole is going to form on a particular road. They're now up to 75% accurate within about 10, 5 to 10 feet. So they can go out there ahead of time and treat that road and tar it up before they have to tear it up to, to fix a pothole. There are so many different applications of AI. I think those X prizes would be, would be fun to watch. Dr. Isabel. So uh, I think there's sort of two answers to this. One, all of us have said in one form or another that AI is interesting in the context of a specific domain. And so there's an X prize for every domain. But the more general question, I think uh, the answer is in the AI lab from the 1990s. I was also in the AI lab in the 1990s, and uh, my advisor was Rod Brooks. If you might recall at the time, uh, he was building a system called COG. And the goal of COG was to build... Uh, I, rem I remember COG. Yes, yeah. the go I, I was probably sitting in the back when he announced yeah. it with you. The interesting thing about COG was the idea was that they were going to build a three-year-old. And I think that the general problem of intelligence uh, is a difficult one, and the real X Prize is being able to build someone we would recognize as sophisticated as a three, four, or five-year-old. Okay, just a speed round here, if you'll indulge me. How, um, all four of you, I'll start here on the left. How, since you mentioned the three-year-old goal that Professor Brooks had, um, how far away is AI from passing the Turing test, the classic Turing test, where if you were talking to this uh, being, sentient being in the computer, you wouldn't be able to recognize it as not a human. How far, how many years away are we? You go first. 20 plus. 20 plus. Dr. Isp. I assume the day after I die, because that's how these things usually work. <laughs> or the day after your funding runs out. <laughs> I, I, I should caution that the Turing test, as it's set up, is kind of a test of human gullibility. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that we'll pass it uh, much sooner than it's said. But if your question is about true human level intelligence, I agree. It's uh, 20, 25 years and beyond, effectively beyond the foreseeable future. It's, it's definitely easier to fool somebody than it is to convince them they've been fooled, right? <laughs> Well said. Dr. Yeah, Buck. I agree with my colleagues. It's equivalent to worrying about the overpopulation of Mars at this moment. But it's the question. So what's your guess? Oh, decades. Yeah. Decades. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. The gentle lady from Illinois is recognized. Thank you. A few of you talked about the investment that needs to be made in this and made uh, into some of the agencies. So what n amount of money uh, per year do you think the federal government should invest in some of the science agencies and foundations that you were referring to? Because it's easy to say we should invest, but what's your realistic? Uh, none of us are, are policy or budget expert, as you can no. see from the few seconds of silence. But uh, <laughs> we're let, silent let, too, so don't worry. <laughs> let, let, let me suggest that uh, you know uh, much more than uh, China. Uh, we have a substantially larger economy. We should be investing a lot more. Do you know than what there. China is investing? Um, I, I don't know the the exact numbers, but it's certainly in the in in the billions, according to their uh, recently released blueprint. Anybody else? So I, I don't know the numbers exactly, but there is uh, funding for NSF, I think is on the order of billions. And this money is highly leveraged and funding graduate students uh, in uh, studying AI in universities, it's a really good way to spend the money to um, accelerate innovation in AI. And we, we do this at our company, we invest heavily in uh, university programs, many grad students, many labs, and We've seen a lot of return in this specific area, so money well spent. So three billion versus six billion, that the extra three billion will be hugely effective in spurring innovation in AI. I was gonna ask you, uh, since your company is big in this area, how are you um, spurring on diversity, more women, more people of color? It is actually a prime directive that comes from our CEO. So it's something that he is very focused on. Uh, we have diversity requirements in our hiring. Everyone knows these requirements. We're in our, in our hiring process, we focus on it. And in our field in particular, um, we've seen firsthand, I have, that additional diversity benefits uh, in many ways. So we talk, discuss bias, transparency, having diversity in 
the scientific um, um, demographics within our company. We have different ideas presented. It's sometimes these uh, issues that you brought up are highly nuanced, and I, they surprise me. And uh, so, um, it, again, it's a directive from our, our CEO. Thank you. Dr. Isbell, you talked about um, increasing diversity, but starting in K through 12. What do you think schools need to do K through 12 to uh, spur interest, or what resources do they have to have? So two short answers to that. The, the, I'll answer the first one first. Um, they have to connect what AI and what computing can do to the, to the lives of the people who are in school. That, that's the single most important thing. Uh, one thing uh, that you just heard uh, is that every dollar you spend on AI has a multiplying effect. And it's true because it connects to all of these domains, whether it's driving, or whether it's history, whether, uh, whether it's medicine, whatever it is. And just connect that what you're doing uh, will help you to do whatever problem you want to solve. But the main limiting factor, fundamentally, is teachers. We simply do not have enough of them. Uh, you ask me how much money you should spend Whatever number you come up with, it's 10 times whatever you will come up with is the right answer. But even if you spent all of that money, we are not going to be able to have enough teachers who are going to be able to reach enough 10th graders in the time that we're going to need in order to develop the next generation workforce. It simply isn't possible. What we're going to have to do is use technology to, to make that happen. We're going to have to make it so that Dr. Etzioni can reach 10,000 people instead of 40 people at a time and can work with people who are locally, who are uh, local to the students in order to help them to learn. That's the biggest, I think, resource for bringing people in who are young. Thank you. May, may, may I just add something r r real quick? It's not just the number of teachers, but it's teacher training. Uh, my kids went to <laughs> fancy private schools in Seattle that had classes called tech. And I was really disappointed to learn that they were teaching them features of PowerPoint because the teacher did not know how to program. So we need to have educational programs for the teachers so that they can teach our, our kids. And b believe me, eight-year-old, 10-year-old, what a great time to learn to, to, to write computer programs. And it'll also help with, uh, at least with, with gender diversity and other kinds of diversity because at that point, kids are less aware of these things and they'll figure out, hey, I can do this. Also, we talked about um, not getting the uh, immigrant community. I serve on the Board of Trustees of my college, and that's something that we talked about. And they shared that the amount of uh, foreign students has gone down drastically because they don't feel as welcome in the country. And it's in engineering and the STEM fields that that has happened. So uh, I think my time's about up. So, oh, I can keep going. One thing I wanted to ask, what are the um, biases you have seen because of the lack of diversity? In, I, I think um, bias is a very important topic. Inherently, there's nothing biased about AI in itself that, as a technique. Um, it, the bias comes from the data that is presented to it. And it is the job of a good data scientist to understand and grapple with that bias. You're always going to have more data samples from one source than another source. It's inevitable. So you have to be aware of those things and seek them out. And a good data scientist never rests until he's, they've looked at every angle to discover that bias. It was talked about in our panel, uh, in our testimonies. The thing I'd, I'd add is an important part of it is, is uh, to detect bias is where did it come from? Traceability is a term that's used a lot in developing AI systems. As you're going through and learning better, newer uh, neural networks, inserting more data, you're recording the process and development. So when you get out to a production system, you can then go back and, and find out why did it make that incorrect judgment and find out where was that bias inserted in the AI process and recreate it. It's very important for self-driving cars and I think it's gonna be important for the rest of, of AI. Um, if you don't mind me going back to your previous question, mm -hmm. I also think it's important that the committee recognize that AI is a remarkably open technology. Literally anyone can um, go buy a, a run on a PC, download some open source software. They can rent an AI supercomputer in the cloud for as little as $3 and get started learning how to use AI. There's online courses from Coursera, Udacity, Industry 2, uh, NVIDIA has an uh, industry program called the NVIDIA you know, Deep Learning Institute to help teach. So this technology is remarkably accessible and open, and I think that it goes to your diversity and making it available. It inspires 
students, kids, with ideas of how they can take data and apply these technologies. There's more and more courses coming online, and I think that'll inspire the next wave of you know, AI workers. If I can just add to that, I think the, the first round of bias comes from all of our beliefs, including myself. The sort of fundamental thing we want to believe is that the technology is itself unbiased and must be, and that it is no more biased than a hammer or a screwdriver. But I will point out that both hammers and screwdrivers are actually biased and that it can only be used in certain ways and under certain circumstances. The second set of bias comes from the data that you choose, which is exactly what Dr. Buck said. I'll give you an example. When I was sitting in the AI lab, apparently across the hall from you, um, a lot of the original work in vision was being done, and particularly in face recognition. Uh, a good friend of mine came up to me at one point and told me that I was breaking all of their, um, all of their face recognition software because apparently all the pictures they were taking were of people with significantly less melanin than I have. And so they had to come up with ways around the problem of me. And they did, and got their papers published, and then they made better algorithms that didn't depend upon the assumptions that they were making from the data that they had. This is not a small thing. It can be quite subtle, and you can go years and years and decades without even understanding that you are injecting these kind of biases just in the questions that you're asking, the data that you're given, and the problems that you're trying to solve. And the only way around that is to, from the very beginning, train people to think through in, in the way that that uh, Dr. Buck said, uh, to think about their data, what it's, where it's coming from, and to surface the assumptions that they are making in the development of their algorithms and their problem choices. Thank you. Bias is a very real issue, as, as you're saying, as, as we're all saying. But we have to be a little bit careful not to hold our database system to an overly high standard, right? So we have to ask, what are we comparing the behavior of the systems to? And currently, humans uh, are making these decisions, and the humans are often racist, they're often sexist, they're biased in their own way. Uh, we know, right, you, you talked about the case with a judicial decision. We have studies that show that when the justices are hungry, you really don't want them to, to rule that point, right? You want them to go to lunch. So m my perspective is, Let's definitely root out the bias in our systems, but let's also think about these collaborative systems where humans are working together with the AI systems, and the AI system might suggest to the person, hey, maybe it's time for a snack, or you're, you're overlooking uh, this factor. If we insist on building bias-free technology or figuring out how to build bias-free technology, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna fail. We, we need to build technology and systems that are better than what we have today. Am I, Ra my ranking last? member, we we need a, an X prize for that to uh, you know figure out when I'm hangry and <laughs> uh, um, and make make better decisions. Okay. My last question is: um, those of you representing companies, do you have uh, internship programs? Or how do you reach out into the community? Oh, certainly. I think the uh, the the most exciting work is happening in our research institutions and even at the uh, undergrad and and earlier levels. Uh, we're a huge proponent of interns. Myself, I uh, was an intern at NVIDIA when I started at the company and uh, worked my way up to, to be a, a general manager. So I'm a huge proponent of interns. They bring fresh ideas, new ways of thinking, new ways of programming. They teach us a lot about what our technology can do. Um, if I'm allowed to comment on your last question. So we talked about bias, but this um, um, line of thinking applies to everything. So transparency, I heard accountability. Um, humans are largely not transparent in their decision making. This is something that's been studied exhaustively by people like Daniel Kahneman. So I think it's very interesting to hear this uh, first time, uh, firsthand, but um, we have to be concerned about uh, humans uh, as well as machines. And as they, when they interoperate, that's even more challenging, but again, Humans are biased, humans are transparent, and this is something to be cognizant of in your um, decision making. I wanted to just stress that. Okay, thank you. All right. Thank you. One of the reasons um, we do these kinds of hearing is hearings is to, to get some of the feedback from the smart people that are doing this, and, and Dr. Buck, for example, when I start, we continue to do our Fatara scorecards looking at Know, how the federal government implements some of these rules. One of the questions we're going to start asking our federal CIOs is, what are you doing to um, introduce artificial intelligence into your operations? So, um, you know, federal CIOs, if you're watching, um, friends at FedScoop, make sure you let them know 
Um, that's going to be coming on the on the round six, I think, of of, of the Fatara scorecard. Um, where where to start? So yes, basic research. It's important. What kind of basic research? Do we need basic research into bias? Do we need basic research into some aspect of neural networks? Like, what kind of basic research should we be funding to to start seeing that you know to raise our to raise our game? And and all, all these questions are, are open to all of y'all. So if 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 y'all want to answer, just make some you know give me a sign and I'll and I'll start. But uh, Dr. Buck, do you have some opinions? Uh, certainly, as data and bias become, um, as data science in general becomes more important, understanding the, the root cause of bias and how it gets introduced and understood, and, uh, I think is a very important basic research understanding. A lot of this work has been done. It can be dusted off and continued. I think it will be increasingly important as we basic, as AI becomes more of the computational tool for um, uh, for changing all the things that we're doing. I, I do feel that th there are different, industry will tackle a lot of the neural network design. You have some of the smartest people in the world here in the US building newer, smarter uh, neural networks. They're largely focused on consumer use cases, uh, speech recognition, translation, self-driving vehicles. I feel like the, the, the science applications of AI, how AI can assist in climate and weather simulations, uh, how AI can assist in healthcare and drug discovery are still uh, early. And it's an area that, that have less of a commercial application, but obviously really important to this country. Uh, you have some amazing uh, computational scientists at the DOE labs that are starting to look at this. I think they also recognize the opportunity that AI can assist in simulation uh, or improve the accuracy or get to the next level of uh, discovery. I think there's some real opportunities there. And, and we're starting to see that conversation happen within the science community. Any more encouragement and, of course, funding to help amplify it would uh, be greatly appreciated. I think you make a great point, right? There is the investment from Google, Intel, and Facebook, but the, but there's so much basic research uh, that, that they won't do. Uh, and I also can't emphasize enough how uh, primitive the state of AI is. Sure, we've made a lot of strides forward, but do so, AI so not, not, not to interrupt, but, but give me some, what, what, what are examples of basic research that they won't do? Um, we should be doing? Common sense, something that you and I and every person knows and uh, AI does not, that a finger has uh, five hands, that uh, people uh, typically look to their you know, left and their right before they cross the street. There's an infinite set of, of information that machines don't have. As a result, they really struggle to understand natural language, right? So we've seen success where the signal is very limited, like in a game of Go or in speech recognition. But all you have to do is turn to Alexa or Siri and realize just how little our AI programs understand and how little uh, can we have a conversation with them. So I think uh, research into natural language processing, into common sense knowledge, into uh, more efficient uh, systems in the sense of that use less training data. All of these are very, very challenging fundamental problems, and I, I could go on and on. Gentleman, name. So I have very strong opinions about this, but, but I will uh, try, to, try to keep it short. I think if I were going to pick one, I'm going to give you two answers. And if I was going to pick one thing to focus on that I don't think we're doing enough of, it is long-lived AI. That is. A lot of the work that we're doing are systems that solve a specific problem for a specific relatively short period of time. That's why it ends up looking like supervised learning as opposed to something like long-term decision making. But if you think about what makes human beings so interesting, there are two things. One is that we depend upon each other, and the other is, is that we learn and we live for a really long time, not measured in minutes or hours, but measured in decades. The problem of reading is hard. It takes human beings six, seven, eight years to learn how to read. We need to understand what it means to build systems that are going to have to survive, not just figure out how to turn the car now, but have to figure out how to live with other intelligent beings for 10, 20, or 30 years. That's, I think, a sort of truly difficult problem. But having said that, I'll back off and say I think the answer is you trust your agencies who talk to the community. 
NSF has a long list of things that they believe are important to invest in AI and, and other things as well, and they get that by having ongoing com uh, communications and conversations with the large community. It creates a kind of market, as it were, of what the interesting ideas are. And I trust them. I listen to them. I talk to them. They're the mechanism that sort of aggregates what people are believing. And then in some sense, what you can do or what government can do uh, or what these agencies can do uh, is to push us a little bit in one direction or another by make, giving incentives for thinking about a problem that people aren't necessarily thinking of. But in general, I trust the people who are doing the work. Dr. Kazu Shahi. Um, so we've been talking about high-level aspects of AI, decision-making, and so forth, but uh, in our, some of our testimonies, we mentioned that there is a substrate for computation that enables AI. You have lots of data, you need a lot of compute. We're at an interesting point in time where we're having rapid innovation in AI, lots of successes. It's being driven by availability by, of data and compute. The amount of data is increasing really, really rapidly, and the, the compute has to commensurately, commensurately increase and power. So that will require basic research and in innovation at the silicon level, at the hardware level, which is what our Intel does. We have fabs. We build the, the, the hardware from, from glass. Uh, so areas such as silicon photonics, uh, analog computing, quantum computing, um, low power uh, computing, all of these areas are potentially great uh, investment uh, NSF funding opportunities for you. Uh, and I'd like to also mention the landscape for getting AI systems to work. It involves so many different things. Uh, it requires machine learning, teachers, and so forth, but it requires things that seem prosaic but are really important, reliable software systems that are accountable, scalable, robust, and so forth. Again, that comes from investing in STEM, uh, computer science, and uh, early stages of uh, someone's career development. So we, we've, we've talked about bias as a potential challenge that we have to deal with as, as we explore and, and evolve in the world with, with AI. Another way you can manipulate a uh, learning algorithm is by loading it up with bad data. Right? What are some of the other challenges and other um, threats to artificial intelligence that we should be thinking about at the same time that we think about bias and integrity of the data that's involved in learning. Anyone? Uh, I'll Dr. emphasize Buck, that, that it's easy to say we have lots of data. It's actually quite challenging to organize that data in a meaningful way. Um, the federal government has vast sources of data. It is very unstructured. And I think <laughs> it, Very uh, aware. And that is a challenge. And I think if we can, uh, there's a, we just spent a decade talking about big data. And as far as I can tell, we've largely collected data and not really done much with it. You now have a tool that can take all that data you've collected and really have some meaningful insights to, to make a new discovery in healthcare, to save enormous amounts of money by finding inefficiencies or worst waste or fraud. Um, but that data needs to be aggregated, cleaned up, labeled properly, and identified. Um, I certainly would make sure that not only the federal government has an AI policy, but also has a, 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 a sister data policy as well to organize and make that data actionable and consumable by AIs, whether within the federal government or make them available to the larger research community. I am sure there are there are dozens, if not thousands, of PhDs waiting to happen if they just had the, the, some of the more interesting federal data to really make those kinds of well, discoveries. Well, Dr. Buck, one of the first things this committee looked at was the Data Act. And shocker, federal government was actually you know, ahead of the game in trying to make sure that we're taking all that data and adding some structure to it. Implementation of that, as you have pointed out, is a bit tricky. Um, so, so any tools that y'all have to help with that would be great. Other, other concerns, Dr. Isbell. So um, I'll add one, uh, which I, I agree with everything that, that um, Dr. Buck said and what other people have said before. Data is the problem, but um, one real issue is uh, we typically build AI systems that don't worry about adversaries. So this ties back into the notion of long-lived AI systems, right? So we're building a system that's gonna determine whether you have a tumor, whether you have a heart attack, whether you should get uh, a mortgage. 
but we're not spending a lot of energy. Some people are thinking about this. We're not spending a lot of energy figuring out what happens when we send these things into the wild, wild we deploy them, um, and other people know that they're out there and they're changing their behavior in order to fool them. Right? And how do we make them change over time? Uh, there's an arms race. You can think about this in security. It's easy to think of. We could think of something even simpler like spam. Uh, you know, I get all this terrible mail. I build a, a system that learns what my spam is. The people who are sending spam figure out what the rules are and what's going on there, and then they change what they do, and it just keeps escalating. And so this notion that you're going to have to not just solve the problem in front of you, but solve the problem as it's going to change on the next round, the round after that, and the round after that, I think that's a real limitation of the kind of way that we build systems, freeze them, and then deploy them. And I'm not saying that that's all people do and that no one is thinking about it, but I do think uh, because we tend to think in this sort of transactional way about AI, we sometimes don't think through uh, the consequences of having long-term systems. Um, I'd like to take it a slightly different tone. So we've talked in our testimonies about bias, privacy, transparency, um, assurances of correctness, adversarial um, agents trying to take advantage of weaknesses in a system. So one thing that I've seen um, in this past year that I haven't seen in the past 10 years is these things are discussed at academic conferences. Companies like um, Intel, uh, my team actually is, uh, these are some of the top priorities, these issues that you raise. They're discussed, they're attracting some of the best minds in the field. Uh, I just introduced the idea of transparency literally a, a months ago, and it's a really interesting area. It's highly nuanced. There was times, for example, if you have, you know, humans are a tribal, multi-agent society, there was times when every, if people have more information, the overall performance of the system goes down. It's a very non-intuitive things can happen. Academics are pouring a lot of effort into this area, so I'm just very, very optimistic that the things we've enumerated uh, today are being addressed, and we should just amplify them so the government can play a, a big role in investing in things like uh, academic research. Um, it is quite different to me, I don't know if you guys concur, but the last major m machine learning conference, NIPS, was really eye-opening to me, that there is a workshop on transparency, there is a workshop on bias, there is a workshop on diversity in the demographics of the AI community. So we are definitely on a very positive and uh, virtuous track, and we, we, I'm asking government to just amplify this however it can. The distinguished gentleman from the Commonwealth of Virginia is now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you to our panel. I, uh, Dr. Etzioni, I, uh, from here, I had a little trouble reading what was underneath the name, and I thought for a minute it said Alien AI. I thought, wow, we really are getting diverse in the panels we're putting together here. Alien AI. I come in peace. Yeah. <laughs> thank God. Um, so, uh, we were reminded rather dramatically last September with the Ecofax hack that compromised information on 145 million Americans uh, as to the risks uh, uh, of devastating cyber attacks uh, and the absolute need for creating shields and, and, and protective uh, measures, uh, both for the government and for the private sector. According to the 2016 report from the NSTC, the National Science and Technology Council, AI has important applications in cybersecurity and is expected to play an increasing role for both defensive and offensive cyber measures. Dr. Khosrow Shahi, and I'm from now on going to say the doctor from Intel, um, how can I a be most useful in defending against cyber attacks? So I'll suggest uh, a few ways, and uh, I guess we'll have other opinions. But uh, so uh, cybersecurity, of course, is a major issue, uh, broadly uh, in computing as well as in AI, and as well as at Intel, it's one of our primary focuses. Uh, so in terms of uh, addressing cyber attacks using AI, cyber attacks uh, are intentionally devious, nefarious, uh, obscure, and these kinds of uh, um, actions are really well suited to the latest state of the art in uh, AI and machine learning. That uh, these algorithms can take large corpora of data, these are inputs from whatever the type of cyber attack um, you're experiencing, and it can build a model of the cyber attack and um, have a, 
a, a response, essentially, and the response can have very low latency. It can, it can study the statistics of the attack, potentially it's a novel attack, build a model, and respond very quickly. Um, so that's one way um, we can address cybersecurity is with better models to defend against it. Another way, another thing that we can, uh, it's a slightly, it's not an answer to your question, but um, when we build models, we, it's good to know the set of possible attacks because uh, a researcher, a data scientist, is very cognizant of building robust models that is resistant to adversarial events. So as we get knowledge of cybersecurity issues in this area in AI, we build in security and defense against cyber attacks into the models such that adversarial actions do not perturb or give erroneous results. Presumably also one of the advantages of AI would be early detection. We could use, I mean, part of the problem with cyber, certainly from the federal government point of view, but apparently in the private sector as well, is when we finally realize we've been compromised, it's too late. Um, and, That's right. And AI has the potential for early detection and diversion, preemption, protective walls, whatever. That's right. The nature of these attacks could be so devious that uh, you know, the smartest human security uh, uh, experts could not identify them. So um, it can be, uh, it can either uh, augment our human uh, uh, security experts or we can have uh, systems that are early detectors that can just flag, is this, this is a potential threat. And these systems are really well suited for doing this, latency and learning very quickly. Anyone else in the panel is more than welcome to comment. Mr. Uh, Dr. Etzioni. I just wanted to add that at the root of the Equifax hack was, was human error, uh, several, several human errors. So something uh, you might want to think about is what are the incentives that we have in place to avoid that? What are the consequences that, that people at Equifax uh, face, and, and not, not to pick on them, uh, for making those mistakes you know, with, with, our, with our data? I think if we put the right incentive structure in place, it's not a technical solution, but it'll help uh, people to be more watchful, and they should be. Yeah. Uh, yeah the, the statistics here are alarming, and the, the rate of attacks are growing exponentially way faster than we can expect a human operator, even with the tools they have today, to, to keep up. Um, this is a very hot uh, topic in the startup community. There are many startups trying to apply AI to this problem. It's a natural fit. AI is effective, is by nature, pattern matching. It can identify patterns and, and call out when things don't match that pattern. Malware is exactly that way. Uh, suspicious network traffic is that way. Uh, one startup uh, we work with, um, they're claiming that top AI, the top AI software is only able to capture about 62% of the potential threats that are out there. But by applying AI, they can shorten the time to discovery and get to 90 plus percent accurate malware detection and the false error rate, get it down to less than 0.1%, where normally it's 2%. It's an opportunity to increase the throughput of, of our detective systems and make them much, much more rapidly responsive. So why aren't we doing it? Is it the cost? The AI just needs to be developed. It's a, it's another, it has not yet been it's developed. A, it is in the process of being developed by those startup companies. It's not a, uh, uh, as sp talked about uh, in ap application as maybe video analytics or uh, uh, ad placement, but it is certainly active. Well, you, you put your finger on two things, um, uh, among others, but one is the um, exponential growth in the, no in the volume of attacks. Uh, I've talked to some federal agencies and I, I'm stunned at the numbers. I mean, I know of one federal agency, not a big one, where the cyber attacks or attempted attacks are in the hundreds of millions a year. And you're absolutely right. I mean, this particular agency, its mission isn't cyber. It, it, it's got a very human mission. <laughs> and it's trying to put together through Band-Aids and other measures some protection. Uh, and it does raise questions about the ability of, in this case, the federal government to protect itself. I'm seeing a sea change in that as well. Uh, not just are we looking to protect our firewalls and the data coming into our firewalls, but the data traffic behind the firewalls. Yeah. Assume you are attacked for the sake of argument and, and look at the, the traffic that's inside your firewall to detect it. Because as it was mentioned before, in many cases you may already be compromised and you don't know it. So it's important to look at both. 
the, the, the front line as well as behind the lines and understanding your, your network traffic and your security. And, and, and the second thing this conversation, you know, uh, I think underscores is the, and we had testimony yesterday from the intelligence community, but the idea that the Russians are not going to continue their attacks uh, and attempts to uh, distort our electoral process is naive. All 17 intelligence agencies in the United States government testified to the fact that it, it is an ongoing threat and, eight, and the midterm elections will be a target. So in a democracy, that's the very heart of what and how we function. How do we protect ourselves? And I think, I think maybe we've got one tool, uh, maybe a very critical tool in terms of artificial intelligence, but trying to get that out to the myriad localities over 10,000 localities in the United States is going to be a different kind of challenge. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lynch, you're now recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Uh, Dr. Azzioni, in your written testimony, you state, and I quote here, we can and should regulate AI applications. Uh, obviously, uh, as, as more and more AI systems are used to collect more and more sensitive and personal data on Americans. There are, there are palpable and real uh, privacy concerns. What, what, are the, uh, what are the ways in which you think that the regulations that you anticipate uh, would, would serve to protect uh, private information of Americans? So I think that um, there's some principles that I can talk about, and f sure. fr frankly, you know, uh, you and your staff are, are probably better better qualified to think through specific regulations. But a principle that I would really advocate is um, identifying when AI is is involved, and, and that's something that we can regulate so that the bots, at least the, the homegrown ones, uh, state that they're AI, right? We had uh, Intel inside, we should have AI inside. Uh, most recently, we've seen that there are examples of, uh, of fake pornography, right? You know, superimposed celebrities on top of bodies and things like that. If we can't trust the integrity of our pornography, we're, we're uh, obviously I'm joking, but, but the point is we should, we should label. Thanks for making that clear. <laughs> We, we, we should label um, when, when AI is being used uh, and, uh, and likewise we, we should be clear when we have AI systems in our homes, right? Uh, Alexa, AI, Barbie, the Roomba um, vacuuming our floor, uh, they naturally also vacuum up a huge amount of data, some of it from our kids, if, if, if Barbie's talking to our kids. We should have regulations about uh, where that uh, information can go. Yeah, I'm just, so the proliferation of AI, I just see it, you know, uh, it, it, it proceeds at a velocity far exceeding the ability of Congress to, to keep up with it. Uh, and that's true with many technologies. And oftentimes it's, it's uh, you know, we rely, we rely heavily on the private sector uh, to look at those ways that uh, if, if AI is being broadly used, how we might develop a protocol that would, would uh, prevent uh, that private information from just getting out there. And we, we have, in a very uh, narrow sense, the Equifax situation where we have uh, the names, addresses, social security numbers of uh, 150 million uh, Americans out there just, just gone. So they basically burnt the entire social security number uh, system as a reliable and secure uh, indicia. So, you know, that, that's gone. And it's just because one company was very lazy about, about protecting data. And so uh, I'm just concerned. I have similar concerns about AI being out there and, uh, you know, these bots. And, you know, we've got, got some pretty creative uh, hackers out there, Russians and others, that have been able to uh, access some very, very sensitive information. Um, you know, at one point they they swept every uh, bit of data from any individual who had applied for you know a high level security uh, clearance in this country, and so I could just see um, if if there are 
as you say, not necessarily, you know, household appliances, but but other um, other forms of AI operating a higher level. If those are hacked, uh, it just increases the the magnitude of our, our our vulnerability exponentially. And I'm just trying to think, you know, in advance as this is all happening in real time. Uh, you know, how do we protect the people who elected us? How do we make sure that, you know, we're all for innovation, but um, I, I think with the appropriate safeguards in place? The, the thing that I would like to highlight, though, is right that uh, you're right, this, those are some scary realities, but there are realities. They're often instigated from the outside, so maintaining our uh, strategic edge, and that's why I emphasize regulating applications as opposed to the AI field and AI research itself. If we adopt an overly defensive, uh, dare I even say, you know, reactionary posture, we're just going to lose. So this is a very competitive global business, and uh, staying ahead, uh, which we're all trying to do in, in various ways through education, et cetera, is, is essential. Okay. Thank you. I assume my time has expired. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Dr. Isbell, did you have a response to that question? I just want to add something. I think it's important to recognize here um, everything that you brought up is, is, are, are deep concerns. But AI is the secondary problem there. The primary problem there is that we are sharing our data constantly. Every one of you has a cell phone, possibly two of them. Um, you have a watch, which is pinging all the Wi-Fi white spots everywhere you go. Each one of those devices has a unique ID. That unique ID is not you, but that unique ID is with you all the time. I can figure out with very little effort who you are, where you are, where you come from. By the way, um, I've deployed systems myself, this is 10 or 15 year old, years old with the technology, where I can predict what button you're gonna press on your remote control after just observing you for one weekend. We are creatures of habit. We are sharing our data in our cars, our phones, everything that we do. The data itself, even if it's anonymized, is giving amazing amounts of information about us as individuals. That's the primary problem. The secondary problem is the AI, the machine learning, the technology, which can look at it very quickly and bring together the obvious connections, even though you've tried to hide them. But the first thing I think to think about is it's not the AI, because computers are just fast. That's just going to happen. It's the fact that we are sharing data, and we've given very little thought to what it means to protect ourselves from the data we are willingly giving to everyone around us. And I don't have an answer, but that in some sense is the root problem. If I could, uh, just uh, the ability of AI to 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 uh, aggregate the data, make sense of it, and and uh, give it give it direction and 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 and, and a purpose uh, and and a use. That's that's the magic of AI. And so the data is out there. And you're right, that's a problem. But I just uh, I'm worried about um, uh, weaponizing weaponizing that raw data that's out there. And and uh, how do we how do we control that? You know. So, but but thank you. I think I think you offered uh, you know a very good clarification. Thanks. I make a short comment. So I'd like to just to balance the discussion, present a slightly dissenting view to, to Dr. Etzioni. Um, Well-intentioned um, efforts such as labeling uh, robots and other devices that use a, employ AI, it could have uninten uh, unintended consequences. You have in the state of California, my state, um, we now know that asparagus and coffee um, cause cancer. So um, we are going to have labels on every piece of uh, food and uh, every building that uh, um, this thing causes cancer. And these, these signs are becoming uninformative. So if we have, um, I would just be wary of unnecessary regulation or imposing re regulation on a very young and rapidly moving field um, because um, I can re immediately see that it can have some adverse consequences. Um, we talked about transparency. Um, to, to use your example, would you want something that is labeled and worse performing or unlabeled and better performing? To use your example of, of the, um, um, and just, uh, just in general, um, our view at Intel is that um, legislation should not be uh, based on, uh, it should be based on principles, not on um, regulation that mandates certain kinds of technology. So we have, we are self-regulating, uh, this field is, Wonderful that it's, it does a lot of high-minded academics who are now leaders in business, and there is a strong impetus to be good uh, uh, stewards of this technology to do good. And we have lots of things that we can impose on ourselves to self-regulate, to 
potentially address some of the adverse conditions that you mentioned. Not all of them, perhaps some of them do need legislation. Um, I've got some final, some final questions, and, and, and this first question is, is for everyone, and, and I know you all have all spent your adult lives trying to answer this question, and so I, I recognize this before I ask, and, and Dr. Buck, I gotta give some kudos to your team that was out at um, the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, they were very helpful in helping me understand some of the nuance of, of, um, of artificial intelligence. And if artificial intelligence was based on Fortran 77, you know, I'd be your guy. Um, yeah. That's my, that's my, my background experience. Um, but I understand how to introduce anti -software, antivirus software into your system. I understand how you introduce CDM into a network. When we ask all the federal CIOs, how are you introducing or thinking about introduce, introducing artificial intelligence into their networks, uh, the first question I'm probably going to get is, well, it's really hard. And, and so my, my question is simple. How do you, and, and, and I, we've all been saying that AI is interesting because it's domain specific, and I, I recognize the, how broad this question is, but how do we introduce AI into a network, into a, into a system, into an agency? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, AI can seem like rocket science. And uh, first off, having this conversation is the first step. Explaining what it is and understanding it so they can comprehend it is obviously the first step. Um, where, and where I've seen it work most successfully is in, in meaningful, simple pilot projects. Uh, project Maven, uh, which is a project of the DoD, where they're using AI to help uh, with reconnaissance so that airmen are not staring at TV screens for eight hours a day waiting for something to happen, but letting the AI do the mundane parts of the job so our soldiers can do the decision making. That kind of uh, application of AI is um, well established. People know how to do it. The network, you don't need to invent a new neural network to do it. It's the same, same work that's being done elsewhere. But by creating these pilot projects inside of these agencies, they're dramatically improving the, the lives of the people that work there. So, so do we believe we're at a point now where the agencies can be the ones that are involved in training the algorithm, okay? You find an algorithm, you figure out what data set you need to train it, and do you expect the person at Department of Interior to be the one training that, or is it folks that are providing that, that service? Um, you can do it both ways. I've definitely seen public partnerships where agencies are going outside to, for consulting to help uh, apply AI technology to a specific problem. Or in some cases, the neural networks are well established. Image recognition is, a well, is where AI started. It is a well-established technique. The networks are open source, the software is open source, and public. Uh, so I think if you find those use cases off the bat that are well-published and, and was spoken in these AI conferences, well-shared, the beauty about AI is it's incredibly open. It's being done in the open source community. It's all being published. And it takes very little uh, work to take one of those established workflows and apply it gotcha. so that they and then the next step is to share that success Dr. Kazwa Shahi so um, the underpinnings of AI today so the AI has changed over um, the last um, 80 years and it's almost surely will change we talked about neural networks five years from now I almost surely I'm on TV but um, I guarantee it's going to be something different um, so, but the underpinnings are you have data, you have model, you have inferences. You have data that has statistical distribution, whether it's images, whether it's a car driving down the road collecting video in the US or Canada or wherever, different, different statistics. That you build models, the models try to understand the statistics of the data, and then you can ask the model questions. Is this a cat or a dog? Is there a stop sign approaching me? That's basically what AI is today. So if you just take these simple underpinnings and then apply them to whatever uh, public policy or application CIOs want to insert into their uh, business workflows and so forth, that's where um, just understanding that, that basic element, there's going to be some, some data. It will have some statistical property, properties. Maybe it will be difficult for a human to understand them. A machine could be better and faster, more robust, uh, more power efficient than the brain. 
and then it can perform inferences. And whether or not you choose to rely on these inferences uh, depends on how successful, how good the model is, how much assurances of correctness you have. I mean, the, the landscape of AI is so vast and it's touching so many different things. And it's still, I would um, again uh, stress that it's very early on. We don't have artificial agents making decisions for us almost anywhere. So uh, even in finance, you would expect automated trading systems. They're, it's not there yet. We're still in the very early stages. There is not widespread adoption in industry. It will get there, but it's still early on. But again, the um, AI, the underpinnings, and the applications is just model, data, inference. You can stick it in anywhere where that um, works. So in the interest of time, I'll keep this short. I, I want to distinguish between at least two different things. One is uh, face recognition and that class of things versus shared decision making. I think the answer for things like face recognition, relatively straightforward. It's, you know, at the risk of oversimplifying, it's like asking the question, when can we, how can we integrate the internet? How can we integrate telephones? Or how can we integrate, my, it's relatively straightforward. It's well understood, it's very clear, and you can ask yourself how to use this screwdriver. The shared decision making is what's difficult. And that requires that the domain experts are part of the fundamental conversation. The research question, from my point of view, is figuring out how to be able to use humans in order to train the systems that we have when they don't understand machine learning and AI, but they do understand their domain. How do you get those people to talk to one another? I'm not worried about the deployment of face recognition. I'm worried about how I'm gonna get an, you know, an intelligence analyst to understand enough about what it is they're doing so that they can communicate to a system that will work with them in order to make decisions. That's where the difficult problem is, but it's really no different than just trying to understand what it is they actually do. The problem is, and the thing that we know, is that people are terrible at telling you what it is that they do. You can't ask them and they tell you. You have to watch them, observe them, model them, and give them feedback. It's an iterative, ongoing process. I wonder if an approach would be to focus on outcomes and metrics and uh, grand challenges. And if you ask for those rather than um, demanding AI, and then they have to resort to AI uh, to satisfy those, those mandates, that, that might work. One minute for all four of y'all all to answer these two questions. What data sets? in the government do you want access to or should the AI community of people that are working on these challenges get access to and what skill sets should our kids in college be getting in order to make sure that they can handle the next phase when it comes to artificial intelligence? All of them. <laughs> and the skills that the students need in college they need to understand computing. There shouldn't be a single person who graduates with a college degree who hasn't taken three or four classes in computing at the upper division level. They need to understand statistics, and they need to understand what it means to take unstructured data and turn it into structured data that they can construct problems around. So on the data sets, um, things like NOA, weather data, uh, things that are not sensitive, uh, have private information, that would, those will be the first. And there's a vast trove of this. This will be immediately usable by academics. Um, but uh, on the skill set side, I think I would just, if I were to pick one, it would be computer science. I would invest as much as possible in teaching computer science, K through 12, especially in high school. Dr. Etzioni. Research funded by NIH, by NSF, uh, DARPA, et cetera, is often not available uh, under open access, right? Journals uh, keep it behind paywalls. Uh, that's changing way too slowly, so the data set that I would like uh, everybody, human and machine, to have access to is the, the data and the articles that you and we as, as taxpayers uh, paid for. I think that's uh, incredibly informant. As far as, as, as the skill sets, uh, I would say that uh, everybody in college should be able to write a simple computer program and to do a simple uh, analysis. And, and, and we can get there, and remarkably, it's not required. Dr. Buck, last word. I certainly would love to see all the data sets. I, I, I certainly also would like to see uh, access to um, the problems around healthcare. And I know those are sensitive topics, but the problem is too important. The opportunity is too great, and uh, it is where I feel like AI will truly save, save lives. Um, if we could figure out how to make that data available, I would, it would be uh, an amazing achievement. 
Um, in terms of education, I believe that data science is becoming a science uh, again. And I also feel like training a neural network is not that hard. I think every, it can be done at the junior high level. And the access to technology is available today. And I think we should start teaching students what this tool can do, because it really is a tool. And it will inspire new applications that will come from the interns, the undergrads, the, the college students. That, uh, that's what makes this fun. Um, well, gentlemen, I, I think my colleagues would agree with me on this. Um, this has been a helpful conversation. Um, there's a lot packed into y'all's testimony that's going to help us to continue to do our work um, on the oversight committee and to look at opening up some of these data sets. How do we double down on NSF funding? Um, how do we focus on getting you know a more? I, I think every kid in middle school should have access to a coding class, and we're working on that stuff uh, down in the great state of Texas. And many of these points that you make, we're going to be talking to folks in the government in early March in the second series of, of this AI series. We're going to be, we intended to invite GSA, NSF, DOD, DHS, and um, to have to continue this conversation uh, about how they are introducing and looking at artificial intelligence and what more support um, they need for Congress. So again, I want to thank you all and the witnesses for appearing before us today. The hearing record will remain open for two weeks for any member to submit a written opening statement or questions for the record. And if there is no further business, without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.